Module 3, The Postpartum Woman at Risk. Postpartum is, once again, often considered the fourth trimester of pregnancy and entails the first six weeks after childbirth. It involves physiological and psychological changes that are returning the body to its pre-pregnancy state, and they usually occur without any complications. However, the major complications of hemorrhage, infection, venous thromboembolism, and specific postpartum mental health issues are conditions that put the postpartum woman at risk. Postpartal grieving and malattachment are also potential issues. Postpartum hemorrhage is one of the top five causes of maternal death. Early postpartum hemorrhage occurs in the first 24 hours after birth, and it's usually caused by uterine atony, meaning it's really flaccid, it's not contracting. Mom is most vulnerable and has the greatest risk in the first hour after delivery. With late postpartum hemorrhage, this can occur any time after the first 24 hours through that six week postpartum period. Postpartum hemorrhage is defined as blood loss that results in hemodynamic changes, meaning we're going to see changes in her blood counts, we're going to see changes in vital signs, her mentation, etc. Or blood loss of greater than 1,000 mLs. Major causes, once again, uterine atony, trauma, platelet dysfunction, or retained placental fragments. With early postpartum hemorrhage, remember this is the first 24 hours after birth, this usually will result from uterine atony, lacerations, and hematomas. These women are at risk for developing hypovolemia, hypovolemic shock, anemia, and potentially the need for a hysterectomy. Clinical manifestations will be dependent on the cause, with uterine atony being the most common. These women will experience pallor, lightheadedness, weakness, palpitations, diaphoresis, restlessness, changes in the level of consciousness, a decrease in their blood counts, and an increase in clotting times. The goal is to correct any underlying causes while controlling hemorrhage and reducing its effects. So with uterine atony, we would do fundal massage, maybe do some drug therapy to help that uterus contract, and remove any retained placental fragments. With laceration and hematomas, it may require surgical repair we can also use some ice and analgesics. With late postpartum hemorrhage, this most often results from retained placental fragments or uterine subinvolition, which is that delayed return to the pre-pregnant state. These women may experience the increased bleeding, a uterus that is not well contracted, lochia that's heavier than expected, a backache, fatigue, general malaise, pelvic pain or heaviness, that temperature elevation, and a foul-smelling lochia. We diagnose it by looking at her blood counts. Her serum HCG levels may be elevated. We can do an ultrasound and that may show us some retained placental fragments. And she may also have an elevated white blood cell count. Again, we need to correct that underlying cause and it may require some oxytocin therapy. A surgical procedure would be a DNC with surgery being a last resort. And if an infection is present, she would require some antibiotic therapy. When implementing nursing interventions for a woman with a postpartum hemorrhage, what intervention would be important to prioritize?
We need to prevent injury. Postpartum infection is also called a purpural infection, and it will most commonly involve the reproductive tract, but it can also involve the breast, wound, or urinary tract. These women will develop a temperature of 100.4 or higher and can be caused by a multitude of organisms. A non-elective cesarean delivery is a major risk because there may be some poor aseptic technique or inadequate hand washing, which would increase the risk. And don't forget that infection doesn't always stay in that one spot. It can spread to other tissues. Antepartum risk factors include a history of an infection, chronic condition, infection of the genital tract, smoking, obesity, and immunosuppression. For the intrapartum period, non-elective C-section, urinary catheterization, episiotomy or a laceration, frequent vaginal examinations, retained placenta or a placenta that requires manual removal, prolonged labor or a rupture of membranes, chorioamnionitis, a birth with the use of instruments, or use of invasive procedures, such as your IUPC. Postpartum would be hemorrhage, a manual exploration of the uterus for retained placental fragments, or development of a hematoma. Endometritis is an infection of the uterine lining that occurs more often with the cesarean birth, which is the most common cause. It may require the use of prophylactic antibiotics during the cesarean delivery to help decrease the occurrence. These women, again, have that elevated temp over 100.4, uterine tenderness, tachycardia, and a midline lower abdominal pain. We treat it, of course, with antibiotics, maybe some oxytocic agents, analgesics, or IV fluids. With the wound infection, this is usually in the postpartum woman going to be in the episiotomy, a laceration, or the cesarean section. Risk factors would be a lochia that is infected, fecal contamination of the wound, inadequate hygiene measures. These women may have pain out of proportion to what we expect, redness of that area, edema of the surrounding tissue. The wound edges have become separated. There's foul smelling, possibly purulent vaginal drainage, tenderness on palpation, fever, and general malaise. Again, antibiotics, supportive therapy, and possibly surgical intervention. Warm compresses can be put on the wound site, a sitz bath or perineal hygiene, wound care as ordered, documentation of the wound healing progression, <coughs> excuse me, and of course, proper education of the client, especially if wound care is needed when the client goes home. Mastitis is infection in the mammary gland. Risk factors include poor hygiene, cracks in the breast tissue, milk stasis, engorgement, clogged milk ducts, cracked, excoriated, or bleeding nipples, nipple piercings, pressure on the breast from too tight fitting bra, or an underwire bra. These women experience general flu-like symptoms and a temp of 101 or higher, malaise, possibly some chills, tenderness, pain and heaviness in the breast, erythema and edema that is in that localized area of the breast that's often in a pie-shaped wedge configuration. So how do we treat it? 
breast massage, supported care, antibiotic therapy, analgesics, warm compresses, and these women should continue breastfeeding if they are. As nurses, we support that continued breastfeeding, helping prevent milk stasis and administer any ordered antibiotics. If she's not breastfeeding, I know we have said that we don't encourage expression of that milk, but we may need to do so because that could be what's causing that mastitis. So we manually express it or use a breast pump. Warm compresses or warm showers can feel really good. Analgesics, increasing that fluid intake, and she may require a consult with a lactation specialist. With the urinary tract infection, this involves infection of the bladder, which is cystitis, or the kidneys, which is pyelonephritis. With cystitis, she may experience frequency urging, burning and pain with urination, a low-grade fever, and possibly some suprapubic pain. With pyelonephritis, she may have the burning, pain, urgency, and frequency, a fever that is high and spiking, and it rises and falls abruptly, hematuria, shaking chills, nausea, vomiting, flank pain, and tenderness. So of course she requires antibiotic therapy, may require antipyretics, analgesics, urinary analgesics, antiemetics, good hydration, and good perineal care. So we definitely need to encourage fluids. So true or false? Mastitis is an infection of the breast characterized by flu-like symptoms. This is true. Venous thromboembolism is an umbrella term for DVTs and pulmonary embolism. The risk will be the greatest in the first few weeks postpartum. The Venous thromboembolism is seen more often after a cesarean delivery, and it can lead to maternal death. Risk factors. We know that the clotting factors increase during pregnancy, and they remain elevated after delivery. The pressure of that pregnant uterus on the lower extremity veins can lead to venous stasis. And vascular trauma and prolonged periods in the lithotomy position can also increase the risk. Other risk factors, maybe they have thrombophilia, hypertension, a personal or a family history of DVTs, obesity, smoking, they're older than 35, have severe varicose veins, they're on bed rest or immobility that lasts more than three days, or they are dehydrated. Obstetrical risk factors would be a history of three or more pregnancies, a prolonged labor, a stillbirth, the use of forceps during delivery, a cesarean birth, or eclampsia. So with the DVT, we've got the formation of blood clots in the deeper veins of the calf, the thigh, or the pelvis. These women will have some edema, some warmth, redness, maybe calf pain or tenderness. Maybe she avoids putting weight on the affected leg when she's up ambulating. And that leg can appear visibly pale or white and have diminished pedal pulses. We need to prevent further clot formation, and this is going to involve some anticoagulation therapy. Make sure that we ambulate mom when her pain and edema are under control. We may need to apply some compression stockings, elevate that affected extremity to promote venous return. Check out those lower extremities for changes in color, temperature, and size. Palpate pedal pulses and apply warm compresses. Monitor her vital signs and give those anticoagulation drugs. 
make sure that when we're giving those drugs that we're also monitoring for bleeding and make sure we give her proper education for when she goes home. With the pulmonary embolism, we know that this is a DVT that breaks free and travels to the lungs and then creates a blockage. We may also have cardiovascular collapse and this can be fatal. These women have to be educated on signs and symptoms of PEs and they need to be reported immediately. This would include a sudden onset of dyspnea or a chest pain, an impending sense of apprehension or doom. They start experiencing tachypnea, tachycardia, their blood pressure drops. Maybe they have some hemoptysis or abdominal pain, cyanosis, or they have a change in level of consciousness. This can be life-threatening and it does require immediate care. We also give supportive therapy, oxygen through a face mask, medication to treat those symptoms, and continuous ECG monitoring. These women need to be in ICU. Nurses, again, immediate action is crucial we need to raise the head of the bed to 45 degrees and stay with her. Notify the RN and the healthcare provider immediately. Get that oxygen going. Assist with getting any lab that is ordered. Prepare for any diagnostics that may be required. And give her that emotional support. Explain what's going on, the procedures and treatments. Postpartum mental health disorders. There's three types. We have the postpartum blues, also known as the baby blues, postpartum depression, and postpartum psychoses. The exact cause of these is unknown, but it is believed to be related to a variety of things, such as hormonal changes, genetics, and the major life and role changes that occur with pregnancy and delivery. The woman and support system should know signs and symptoms of each of these disorders to be able to seek necessary care early in the process. With postpartum blues, this is the most common, but it's also the least serious. It's pretty transitory. They may have sadness, crying. It's really related more to the hormones and it'll start about two to three days after delivery. It will usually resolve by the end of two weeks. With postpartum depression, this begins to affect the ability to function, but the woman continues to maintain her perception of reality. It is a non-psychotic depressive disorder. Previous or risk factors include a previous episode of depression, stressful events in their lives, problems in relationship with a partner or spouse, inadequate or a lack of social support, unplanned or unwanted pregnancy, a family history of psychological problems, a history of physical or sexual abuse, intimate partner violence, a miscarriage, a stillbirth, or neonatal death, or a neonate that is born with congenital malformation or some serious health issues. Consequences of untreated postpartum depression includes difficulty with that normal maternal infant attachment process. It can cause problems in the marriage and maternal suicide. These women have strong feelings of sadness. They're irritable, anxious, frequently cry. They lack interest in the surroundings, have trouble motivating themselves to do normal activities, like even taking a shower or eating, cleaning the house, etc. They have a disinterest in other people, a lack of enjoyment of life, intense feelings of inadequacy, an inability to cope, ambivalence, guilt, unworthiness. They can't sleep. They have a loss of libido. 
a decreased appetite, an inability to concentrate, overwhelming fatigue, obsessive thinking, and suicidal thoughts, not only towards themselves, but towards the infant. So we can diagnose this by looking at their symptoms. They have to be present for most days for over a two week or for at least a two week period. We can also use the Edinburgh postnatal depression scale. <coughs> Excuse me, and we need to rule out any underlying medical conditions. Most cases will be treated outpatient, but severe cases have to be hospitalized. They're treated by trained mental health professionals. It requires antidepressant therapy, maybe even some electroconvulsive therapy. Early detection and treatment are vital. Nurses need to provide education regarding these warning signs and symptoms and explain the importance of those treatment plans. We also need to acknowledge feelings of the woman with postpartum depression and assist her in obtaining support. So then we have postpartum psychoses, which these women will experience a severe distortion of reality. And this includes having hallucinations and delusions. It is a rare mental health disorder, but has severe consequences if we don't treat it. It mimics severe bipolar disorder, disorder, mania, depression, confusion, abnormal behavior, psychoses, agitation, and insomnia. These symptoms will appear abruptly sometime during the first few months postpartum. It is a medical emergency and it requires inpatient treatment in a mental health facility. So once again, these symptoms have a sudden onset and usually will occur this first two weeks after delivery. They have delusions, hallucinations, severe agitation, restless or irritability. They may be hyperactive, euphoric, or have little concern for themselves or the infant. Depression, including preoccupation with guilt, feelings of worthlessness and isolation, extreme overconcern for the infant's health, sleep disturbances, and poor judgment with confusion. Suicide and infant, infant side are possible. Again, it is a mental health emergency and it requires immediate hospitalization. Antipsychotic agents, may require that electroconvulsive therapy and definitely some psychotherapy. Remember that this requires specialized mental health training. It is beyond the scope of practice for that obstetrical nurse. However, as obstetrical nurses, we need to be aware of the signs and symptoms. So early detection and prompt intervention can occur. And then we have some special postpartum situations. Grief in the postpartal period is not an uncommon thing. Not all pregnancies end with that happy family going home or with a happy or healthy newborn. And realize that some women will experience some semblance of grief just because they are no longer pregnant. Men and women will differ in their response and that can result in misunderstandings in a marital situation. Women might place that newborn up for adoption and that can be a complicated and difficult choice that some women face. They enter a very somber period of grief and detachment as they separate themselves from their newborn. This requires on the nurse's part a non-judgmental support and we need to be aware of our own feelings and attitudes. We also have to make sure that she is kept informed of her rights and her options. She does have the right to change her mind and be knowledgeable of the institution's policies as well as state laws. We do have families that have congenital anomalies in the newborn. 
So helping the family adjust to a newborn with these anomalies is a challenge for the postpartum nurse. The woman and family grieve the loss of their dream child and they have to learn to accept a child that is not one that they expected. We encourage frequent interaction with the newborn, point out positive features, and role model healthy behaviors. We should also encourage the parent joining a support group. And unfortunately, there are families whose fetus or newborn has died. These parents are often unprepared to deal with their new reality, and they frequently will voice questions to which there are no good answers. Coping with loss is also stressful for the nurse, and I will tell you from experience, this is a challenging situation. So to help provide meaning to the family during this time, we do encourage that the parents name that newborn. We assist them in collecting some memory items. For example, taking pictures, uh, the facility I used to work in, we would get a cast of the foot or hand. We get footprints and or handprints for the family, a lock of their hair. We allow the uh, family or mother to assist with this process if that is what they choose to do. If the parents want to spend time with the newborn, then they need to do that. Uh, we clean them up, we wrap them up, dress them as uh, appropriate. Save memory items per facility policy for later pickup by the parents. You know, we definitely need to give them the, the newborn bracelet. And make sure that you avoid non-therapeutic or hurtful statements. A family can also experience other grief provoking events. You know, they have that loss of the ideal newborn. Maybe they had a different route of delivery. They wanted a vaginal delivery. They counted on this. They, they went to classes, but they ended up with a C-section. Or maybe they expected a male and they got a female and this causes some grief. Maybe they don't realize they're experiencing grief reactions and they feel guilty because they don't feel as happy as they should. So it's important to monitor mom for grief and encourage her to discuss her feelings and avoid any patronizing statements. And then finally, we have malattachment in the postpartum period. We know that the relationship of attachment begins when mom finds out she's pregnant and it does continue throughout the pregnancy. But maybe there were difficulties during the pregnancy or mom is immature. She has an unreliable support system that can also put the family at risk for malattachment. Things to look for. There's a lack of eye contact with you and or the infant. There's a lack of verbal stimulation or a lack of response to the newborn's cries or cues. Make sure that you report suspected signs of malattachment to the RN and consult with the psychologist or a clinical social, social worker may be required. So true or false? The nurse should explore possible cultural beliefs before assuming a mother is demonstrating malattachment to her newborn. This is definitely true. And now, coming up, your post-test. <laughs> 